Hi, this is Pod Save the UK. I'm Coco Khan. And I'm Nish Kumar. And don't worry, we haven't fallen out and are refusing to share the same studio together. No, no, this week Nish is bringing a little Canadian flavour to the show. Yes, I'm in Toronto uh, on a family holiday, which, whilst lovely for me, is of absolutely no editorial use for us whatsoever. But don't worry, keeping me company in the studio instead is Labour's Shadow Attorney General, Emily Thornbury. Yes, that's right. We're going to find out if Labour has got what it takes to save the UK. Hi, Nish. How's, uh, how's Canada treating you? Hi, Coco. As you can see, it's a uh, glorious sunshine behind me in this authentic Toronto skyscape. That is in no way a background that the studio very kindly and hastily put on a television screen behind me. I read in the news today that uh, Toronto is experiencing some uh, substantial air pollution due to wildfires. Yeah, the main part of the reason why there is a backdrop behind me uh, of the Toronto skyline is I am deep in the bowels of the Rogers Centre, which is uh, actually the uh, stadium where the Toronto Blue Jays play baseball, uh, which uh, for non-North American listeners is uh, basically uh, cricket for slightly cooler people. And the other reason that we've got a backdrop behind me is because the Toronto sky has got an unsettling shade of red-brown. Oh, gosh. Uh, It is... I don't think it's ever a compliment when people say things feel a bit like Mad Max. Like, that's never a good comparison to draw. And so, yeah, it's gone... It's a little bit Mad Max in the background uh, of Toronto at the moment. Right, Okay. I was going to make a joke about you being over there for a trade deal, but given the kind of natural apocalypse you're facing, it seems a bit, maybe too soon. No, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely, uh, it's dusty out in those Toronto streets. Okay, so let's focus on the big political story of the week. So Rishi Sunak started the week in Dover. He's bigging up his Stop the Boats campaign. But right now he's in Washington for his first official visit to the White House as Prime Minister. Now, I know we have a lot of international listeners to whom he won't be quite as familiar as Boris Johnson. So Nish, how about a quick guide to Rishi Sunak? You've got 60 seconds, go. He is the first ever Prime Minister of Colour. Uh, He's a British Indian man. Uh, He was uh, educated uh, at Oxford University and uh, the elite sort of uh, private school, Winchester. Um, He has a background uh, as an investment banker and working at uh, hedge funds. Uh, He has a connection to America because he actually met his wife while he was studying at Stanford University in California. He still keeps a house in Santa Monica and somewhat controversially continued to hold a green card up to two. 2021. Um, He's had a meteoric rise uh, to 10 Downing Street. He was still not particularly known to the wider public when he replaced Sajid Javid as Chancellor in February of 2020. Uh, On a personal level, he's known to be a lover of the Star Wars film franchise and uh, described himself as a coke addict. Uh, Now, uh, just to be clear, that is Coca-Cola, uh, I don't want Rishi Sunak suing me. Uh, fingers crossed, Joe Biden has learned his name by now uh, because when he became Prime Minister, Joe Biden congratulated a man called Rashid Sanuk, which bears as much <laughs> resemblance to Rishi Sunak's name as uh, Adele Dazeem did to Adina Menzel's in John Travolta's <laughs> infamous Oscars gaffe. Um, someone else who knows a lot about Rishi Sunak because she has to look him in the face every single day is our special guest, Emily Thornbury, Shadow Attorney General for England and Wales and Labour MP for Islington South and Finsbury. She's also a former Shadow Foreign Secretary and Shadow Trade Secretary and she was effectively Jeremy Corbyn's number two when he was leader. Hi, Emily. Hello. <laughs> What's your experience has been in in the states and with President Biden? I um, I've only met President Biden once, and I met him in Britain. In fact, I was I was introduced to him by Theresa May through gritted teeth. Um, and uh, <laughs> anyway, I spoke to him, and he said, "Oh, oh, Labour, Labour. If I was in the UK, that would be my party, right?" And I said, <laughs> "Yes." <laughs> Oh, okay, cool. (laughs) That was it. Oh, right. So was he genuinely asking that, like, right? Please confirm that, right? I think it was just the way that he spoke and the way that he was. You thought, 
I probably need to affirm that he's he is correct. If he has any worries about it, <laughs> Labour is his party. He I just thought maybe like about Ed Davey had been in his, in his ear. No, no, no. Good Lord, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so part of Rishi Sunak being over there is to make a pitch for Britain to be an international player in AI, um, which, you know... Sounds great, but ultimately it's quite sad because we are not part of the global conversation because we're out of the EU. Um, I'm just wondering, Nish, what are your thoughts on uh, on Sunak's plans? Well, I mean, obviously, one of the things that was promised in the kind of Brexit deal was that we would have a sort of um, UK-US trade partnership. The fact that that's not even being discussed uh, is obviously suboptimal. Um, But yeah, he's gone out uh, to try and pitch the UK as a kind of global uh, leader on AI. Um, It's obviously a somewhat concerning situation, um, given that uh, experts, including the heads of OpenAI and Google DeepMind, have warned that artificial intelligence could lead to the extinction of humanity. And I, again, like to continue the dystopian film theme, it is a little bit concerning when experts in the field are saying we're basically on the verge of Terminator. AI then? What's Labour's plan for AI? So I have to say, I, I mean, I wrote an article about this seven years ago saying how concerned I was that we didn't have any, we weren't thinking this through and it could run away with us. Mm. You know, if you have artificial intelligence that is autonomous, that can make its own, you know, that uh, that can learn itself, that can be, you know, the, the question is, can we pull the plug on it? Are we getting it into our systems in such a way that it will be able to make decisions that can be of enormous importance? It could be about safety. It could be about, about uh, you know, the, to what extent might we even be using it in terms of warfare and, mm. and this sort of thing and are we going to be able to pull the plug on it that's the real question can we unplug it or will we end up with it being so far into our systems that will affect our way of life so much and we will never have put down any sort of control that's what i wrote seven years ago seven years on nobody seems to have done Mm. anything really about that but you know we do need to begin with that and we do need to begin with are we letting this into our systems without any control will it be able to make its own decisions will it you know, profoundly affect us. If so, we need to have some form of of regulation of that. Mm, mm. And we need to know, where is it learning things from? (laughs) What is it learning? And how is it making decisions? And in what way will it affect us? And if people can't answer those questions, we shouldn't be using it. There are other ways in which you can use AI in limited ways that can really enhance our way of life, that can be incredibly helpful. There's clearly some advantage to it, but there's sort of no point in... I think this is also part of the problem when you have someone like Sunak in power, who at the moment is almost, I mean, you're you're talking to a guy who's probably not going to be in the job uh, in a year and a half's time. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about things like AI that do have, you know, plausible threats to the future of the species. It is a bit of an issue that we have somebody who may not be in the job in a year and a half's time. And certainly isn't really able to manoeuvre a huge amount within his own party to actually get legislation passed. I think that's right. I think we have a zombie government. But I think that, and I think if you look at AI as a very good example, what he does is he goes to the United States and his answer is that he wants there to be an international conference in London about AI. He wants uh, Britain to have an international research body. He wants the global watchdog on AI to be in the UK, all of which sounds fine. Let's hope he can deliver it. But it isn't really an answer in itself but it kind of looks good. And that goes back to what I'm saying is that everything is kind of superficial. Everything is about trying to dampen down the problems, keep things calm, keep things relatively still and hope for the best. At least hope that you're avoiding the worst. And that's not exactly leadership. You know, that's not exactly what our country needs at the moment when we have so many challenges. And frankly, if you look at what they have been doing for the last 13 years, you do wonder what is it that they can say at the next election we have achieved this. Yeah. A Tory government has delivered this. Is anybody any richer? Well, the richest are richer, but is anybody else any richer? Are any of our public services any better? Have there been any big infrastructure projects? I mean, they've delivered Brexit, which is somewhat controversial. But otherwise, what have they achieved? Well, someone who has been an unlikely ally uh, in taking down the Tories is Prince Harry. Um, I don't know if there's much coverage of this story over there, Nish, but it's wall to wall today. Uh, As we speak now, he's in the witness box giving evidence for a second day in his hacking case against the publisher of the Daily Mirror. 
for somebody who is uh, still, uh, at least in familial terms, part of the royal family, it's a pretty extraordinary intervention. Uh, Harry said that uh, Rishi Sunak's government is at rock bottom uh, and avoids scrutiny by getting in bed with friendly newspapers. And he, he actually told the High Court that our country is judged globally by the state of our press and our government, both of which I believe are at rock bottom, which is, I mean, pretty strong language uh, for Harry to have used. To be honest, I'd have liked to see a little bit more of this in his book and a little bit less about him rubbing uh, cream on his dick. I think that that might have made the book a bit more of a substantive text if Harry had included a stinging man. critique of the UK power establishment instead of being the old... The old cream dick stuff. Listen, it's relatable content, Nish. That's why he's doing it. <laughs> he's just like everyone, I, I guess. Um, Emily, can I offer a suggestion? Get Prince Harry to endorse the Labour Party. <laughs> what do you think? I think he just has. <laughs> Ooh, touche, touche. Yeah, I think if you say something's at rock bottom, you're endorsing almost whatever the alternative is to that. <laughs> wow, I would, that, that would be quite the plot twist, wouldn't it? Prince um, Harry comes how... out, he's got a l little Labour rose in his profile. What? <laughs> <laughs> I... Like, obviously, I'm following this uh, online, but I'm not there. Um, uh, how have the uh, British press reacted to being called a bunch of assholes by a man who was already one of their least favourite people in human history? Well, they, they couldn't get more cross. I mean, they couldn't be more cross anyway, so it doesn't really matter. I mean, the, the, I, there was a nice bit of colour, I think, in one of the papers about um, the, uh, the Guardian's political correspondent, the one who sits up in the public gallery and makes jokes. And he was, he had got a day off from Parliament and had gone off to uh, to the Royal Courts of Justice and wanted to use the loo. And there was a big burly man standing in the way and he kind of pushed his way past and uh, went into the loo. And there was Prince Harry at the Urinals. <laughs> <laughs> stood next to him. Hello, <laughs> hello. <laughs> that was it. That was the best bit of you know, light we've had really from this. Um, I also would like to mention that even though Prince Harry has accused tabloids of hacking his voicemails, the publisher's lawyers have said that legitimate sources were behind many of the stories about him and they denied that journalists had acted unlawfully. Well, I think that's covered us from being sued, Coco. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. Thank you. I'll I do think my you best. just have to say allegedly a few times and then everything's fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But on the subject of Prince Harry, you know, how amusing it is aside, it does raise some very, very serious questions about who actually is running Britain? Who is in power? I mean, what's your position? What's Labour's position on regulating the press? I genuinely think it comes back to the BBC. I think having as a, a load bearer, a... a an institution which is run by public money, which is independent of government, but who can be relied on and trusted and isn't subject to pressure from government. And I think that most people get their news from the 10 o'clock news and they get entertainment from the newspapers. And I think that actually the print, printed media is sets the agenda in a way that it shouldn't. And the BBC... And following it, ITV and Channel 4 um, should have more confidence in being able to make their own decisions about what is. And I think you see it more and more. Um, and, the, and the print journalism having less influence than they think they do. Um, but, I mean, I can't pretend that we aren't mindful of what the printed media says, not because of what necessarily that many people reading it and believing every word, but because it affects broadcast media and broadcast media is really where it's at and I think that as we get increasing other you know social media as well becomes more important and Facebook becomes more important so I think we're seeing the kind of you know the, the print media being in 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 great difficulties and not being a trusted source of information anymore. Well, we're thrilled uh, to be joined by Emily Thornbury today uh, on Pod Save the UK. And we have spent the last few uh, weeks uh, largely slagging off the Tory party. And I hold my hands up as being principally responsible for that. Emily, I've always laid my cards on the table. I am a uh, lifelong Labour voter who lacks imagination uh, in the uh, voting booth. I I'm not sure that there's any institution apart from maybe the BBC that I have 
such a complicated relationship with and yet continue to support unequivocally. <laughs> Maybe Manchester United. It's, it's, I think it's those three. It's the Labour Party, Manchester United and the BBC. Um, now, it's a kind of... It, as we speak, uh, the Labour manifesto is being worked on. And given the state of this country and given the changes that are needed, I think there are a lot of us who would like this to be a bold and radical manifesto. So my first question for you, Emily, is am I going to be disappointed? I think that what you're going to get is you're going to get a manifesto that will have real substance to it but will also be completely believable and realistic. I think that we need to be an antidote to 13 years of Tories who constantly promise the world and don't deliver anything. And what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to say, we will do this and the money will come from here. We will do this. And here is the, you know, the, the background in terms of policy and the legislation that we will do. And we will do it well. And we will slowly bring our country out of the mire and we will be a country to be proud of again. And we will have an economy that will be growing. We will look after public services. We will have a more equal society and we will be able to hold our heads up high. And, we've, uh, and what we've done is we're beginning the process. So we're, you know, we're beginning the process in terms of we have... Uh, Keir has talked about missions and talked about the sort of things that he wants to do in relation to the NHS, the state of the economy, crime, uh, crime on the street, opportunities for young people, and the most important one of all, of course, which is the issue as to what we're going to do about the future of the planet. And, and we will have policies. We are in the process of putting them together. Um, and it's taking us some time and we're doing it with great care. But we're serious about government and we want to do it well. And if the public give us the great honour of letting us serve them, we want to step up and to be worthy of, uh, of the opportunity that will be given. Starmer's personal ratings are pretty underwhelming. Are you concerned about that? Well, I think that when Keir talks about things that he really believes in, you can see it. You can see it. I mean, I was there when he did a speech about crime and about how it had been his lifelong mission to make people feel safer, to ensure that people were brought to justice. And unfortunately, not very many people saw it, you know, but I was there and I was sort of 20 feet away. And I mean, it was amazing. I sent him a message saying, I honestly have not seen you speak like that for a very long time. And it was just because he spoke directly from the heart. Um, so it's, it's certainly there. I mean, you know, he is also... Do you know what? What happens with Labour leaders, right? <laughs> it's, and I think maybe they say it with all leaders, is you've got to be perfect, right? You can't make a single mistake. You can't say anything wrong. You can't scratch your nose. You can't eat a bacon sandwich. But on the other hand, you've got to be relaxed and you've got to be like people are. And you can't be both. And yet, you know, and it doesn't matter. And if you go down one path, then you get criticised by the other half. And if you go down this way, then people say, you're not perfect enough. And so it goes on. You know, and they'll make exceptions, you know, for some Tory leaders, but they'll never make that exception for a Labour leader. And that is the truth. I don't know why we are, but we are, we are held to a different standard. Mm. And that's just kind of like, there's no point saying, you know, it's not fair because it doesn't matter really whether it's fair or not. It's the truth. And so we've just got to, you know, he has a, there isn't a more difficult job in the whole world, I don't think, than being leader of the Labour Party when we're in opposition because of the tabloids, because of the, the attitude um, and because of this kind of you've got to prove yourself. You've got to prove yourself. You're not in power, but you've still got to prove yourself. You know, and, you know, you may not have a civil service, but we want to have the, the all the details of your policies, you know, before you get into government. Um, we, the Tory party, can be in government and we can make ridiculous promises that we will never deliver. And everybody knows that we won't deliver, but somehow or other, that's all right. But the Labour Party has always got to be absolutely truthful and sound. So, Emily, I just want to play you a clip here. Earlier in the series, we interviewed Will Moy, CEO of fact-checking charity Full Fact manifestos, we call them bullshit manifestos, that are about a world that doesn't exist and making promises about a world that cannot exist. What is the point of writing a manifesto? What is the point of reading it? And to be honest, I have some sympathy with people who say, what is the point of voting? So we've got to push back and expect more than that. We want to end bullshit manifestos. We want to hold parties to a standard where you've actually got to show how your manifesto adds up. You've got to make claims that are actually checkable 
and meaningful so that people can ultimately work out whether your promises work and whether you've implemented them in the end. So, can you promise us a bullshit-free manifesto? That's what I'm saying. And and in order for us to be able to have a manifesto where we can cost everything, you know, we will and we'll put that before people and it will be realistic and it will be costed. And then people will go, is that it? Where are the unicorns? You know, that's the point. And the Tories can promise the unicorns and somehow or other that's all right. Um, but, you know, but we will be. That's what we're going to do. You know, we're, pro- we're going to produce a manifesto that, that, uh, that, that will be, you know, subject to the, a huge amount of scrutiny and it needs to be kind of bomb-proof. I was glad to hear you talk about, you know, ultimately when voters give you their vote, it's, a, it's an honour and it's a privilege. I'm a, also a lifelong Labour voter, but I've felt quite taken for granted, I think. You know, I'm a person of colour. Mm. I'm from a working class background. I live in London. I think everybody mm. knows where my vote is going. And sometimes I felt kind of frustrated that I'm just assumed that I will continue to vote Labour. And that's maybe not necessarily always the case. Mm. Um, the next general election will be the first at which millennials are likely to outnumber boomers. Young people have had a very bad ride, 13 years of it. I've actually Absolutely. never voted for a party that's won. <laughs> that's more about my age, I think. But um, I wanted to ask you about the where you see young people in Labour's mission. I think what was said about housing is kind of absolutely speaks to a generation that has just been ignored. And if people just don't have a chance of being able to own their own homes or rent anything halfway decent because in the end we don't have enough houses, we don't have enough homes. And we have to. And Keir has made it clear, and I think it was actually, this was a radical, you want a radical policy, that's a radical policy, you know, saying that we will be, we will change the planning system, we are going to build homes, we are not going to have, you know, we're not, we're, we, we are going to be ignoring the naysayers, you know, we are going to be building, and if we have to build on the green belt, we'll build on the green belt, but we're going to build, and we're going to have regional targets, and local authorities must you know, must must deliver on those targets. Mm. And and there is no ifs or buts, that's it, they've got to do it. Um, because my generation are fine. You know, my generation, as you say, you know, I'm a I'm a boomer and I'm fine, you know, and my generation have either got secure social housing or got onto the property ladder at a time when it was really quite cheap. It was all right, we could get there, you know. I mean, I lived in a hard-to-let flat. I lived in a hard-to-let. I mean, people don't even know what that is now. That was a council flat that nobody wanted, right? I didn't have any heating and the lift was a bit dodgy, but at least it was my flat and it cost £14 a week, you know, in Poplar. And I saved enough money to pay for a I deposit just, and then got I onto the property my, ladder. I my you know? spirit leaving my body when you said 14 I know, it's a week. Imagine, like, what imagine. <laughs> I mean, as I say, it was cold. Yeah, it was yeah, cold, yeah, you yeah. know. It was a shame the heating ad didn't work. But, you know, but nevertheless, the, that's, the point is I'm from a different generation and, and I'm all right. And I, what we need to do is have a bit of imagination, a bit of empathy for a younger generation that has had nothing done for it. And, you know, my generation, you know, has got all the pension funds and has eaten all the fish and killed all the tigers and has homes and everything else. And the younger generation should be much angrier, I think, than they are. Than they are. And they certainly should vote. Yeah. Well, I, I, I just want to pick up on something you said um, previously about in terms of it being an easier game for Tory leaders in some mm. uh, in some instances. I, I would 100% agree with that. I think for the last 13 years, because of the political weighting of the print media particularly, which sets the political agenda for the country, yeah. it is being a Tory leader is politics on easy mode. Um, and yeah. but in terms of, can I just can I just give you an example of that? So I, yeah. so I I um. When Cameron was leader of the opposition, he would cycle in and so would I. So we would meet at the bike sheds. (laughs) (laughs) Have a cheeky cigarette? Cheeky cigarette, Emily? Yeah, well, on my part, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Anyway, um, and... uh, and the point was that I met him again and we were both for some reason sort of getting on bicycles again. But he was prime minister at this stage. I don't quite know why. But anyway, he was and he was having suddenly a hard time because he was trying to argue that against the against the print media that we should remain in the EU. And suddenly everyone they were turning on him and he was saying they're being so terrible. And I just said, 
welcome to my world. You know, this is what it's like being in the Labour Party all the time. And, uh, but he was so shocked that things had turned on him the way that it had. But just speaking as a Labour voter, I know there'll be a lot of people listening to this podcast that might have some concerns around Keir Starmer's integrity and the integrity of his promises because in his leadership campaign, there were certain pledges around the abolition of tuition fees, taxation on the highest earners and nationalisation of key industries that have fallen by the wayside. So I guess my question is, how can we trust this round of manifesto pledges? So I think that what we have to look at, and I think it's always the way in politics, is that you may make pledges at a certain time, a point of time, but then a lot happens. So since Keir made the pledges in advance of the leadership competition, we have had COVID, we've had the Tories crashing the economy, we've had a bad Brexit, um, and things are very different, unfortunately, than the way that they were in 2018, 2019. So that's why the, the politics has changed, the economic the economics has changed, and so Keir has had to change with it. That doesn't mean that you don't believe the same things that you did before, because you do. Um, there are many good things that we want to do as Labour politicians, but we will be constrained by the fact that, you know, it happened six months ago, the Tories completely crashed the economy. And again, it's as if it didn't happen. <laughs> Nobody talks about it now. It's as if people are expected just to forget about it. Well, we haven't forgotten about it. And unfortunately, as, for example, people with fixed mortgages, when they get their new mortgage come in, it will be much more expensive. But it's also much more expensive for the, econ for the economy now because the economy was crashed in the way that it was and because we've had no growth. And we've got a bad Brexit. You know, we've got a Brexit deal that doesn't work for our country and they're doing nothing about repairing it. So there are all of these different things. And then obviously, you know, there is the huge debt that was um, that was brought in during COVID and all of the fraud and all of the bad contracts and they are not doing anything about getting the money back. Do you know when an election is going to be? Because I'm 35 and I am. I need to have a child soon. I'm told <laughs> that 35 is the cliff. And, but I'm also a political podcaster, so I don't really want to be going into Labour as Labour come in. It's uh, poetic, but it's uh, not really what I'm after. So, you know, if, any any ideas? Nobody knows because he hasn't decided yet. I mean, I think he's kind of hoping to, to spin it out as long as possible. Um, and as I say, hope that something turns up or that Labour makes a mess of things. But they don't have a plan as far as I know. And obviously the local elections were so bad for them that I think that it's pushed an election further into the future. Um, they're not rushing to the polls, are they? They're just hoping that something will change. It's going to be such a classic, isn't it, Nish? Labour will come in, I go into Labour. What a nightmare. <laughs> not enough political shows where the interviewers just outright ask politicians, <laughs> when should I when Get should I start trying for a bad <laughs> No, they don't. They don't. The priorities are all wrong. <laughs> Those are the most important questions to ask. Pod Save the UK is brought to you by Blinkist. The Blinkist app enables you to understand the most important things from over 5,500 non-fiction books and podcasts in just 15 minutes. There's also a new feature uh, called Blinkist Connect, um, which allows you to make a list of titles you would share with your best friend. What titles would you share with me, Coco, as I am your best friend? <laughs> I have other friends, please, sir. Yeah, why are you laughing at that? <laughs> Well, I hope there's a book on Blinkist called How to Deal with Hurt Feelings. <laughs> but, Nish, as my best friend, the book that I'm interested in is called Walking on the Right. It's all about conservatism, and I think that maybe you and I need to get into the minds of the right wing a little bit more. Now, of course, we don't want to spend too long on it, so 15 minutes is about right. Thanks, Blinkist. Um, and Coco, uh, I'll recommend to you uh, Fear by Bob Woodward, uh, which is uh, Bob Woodward, of course, one of the journalists that broke the Watergate scandal. Uh, his account of the behind the scenes situation uh, in the chaos of the Trump presidency. Um, uh, 22 minutes it means you get the key salient points of that book, but you don't have to spend too much of your day thinking about Donald Trump. 
And right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash PSUK to start your seven-day free trial and get 45% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash PSUK to get 45% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash PSUK. For a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account, where you'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. So, Emily, we thought that maybe you could help us with our mailbag. So that's where we get our correspondence from the listeners. We set ourselves up as an agony auntie and uncle. I'm still not happy about this terminology, Nish. I can see Nish is doing a thumbs up for yeah, the listeners. Yeah, of course I'm happy about it. I, I'm literally an uncle uh, as of uh, about four days ago. My brother's wife gave birth to my nephew. So for me to quibble about being considered uncle now is literally nonsense because I am quite literally someone's uncle. Well, I am not anyone's auntie and I'm, as everybody knows, 21. So that is far (laughs) too uh, young to be an auntie. But anyway, we've had a few interesting emails bringing up tactical voting that we'd love to get your thoughts on, Emily. So this has come in from Laura. She says, this is my dilemma. Traditionally, I have always voted for the Green Party and I consider myself a left-wing socialist or socialist adjacent voter. I don't know if that's a reference to you, Nish, because you love an adjacent. (laughs) Um, However, in the last election, I voted for Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party as I believed in what they stood for and thought they had a good chance of convincing enough voters to oust the Tories. Since Keir Starmer has taken over, I've been very unhappy with his treatment of unions, his disdain of the left of the party and his backtracking on progressive policies. But it seems like they might actually be able to beat the Tories this time. So do I vote for a party I don't believe in because anything is better than the Tories? Or is tactical voting ever right? Please help me. Vote Labour. Vote Labour. And vote Labour as a... a Greens should vote Labour. Because you know what? We are the Green Party. Because look at our policies. Look what we said at the last conference. We talked about investing in our country and changing the way in which our economy runs. We talked about bringing doubling the amount of offshore wind, doubling the amount of onshore wind, making sure that we had factories for making batteries for electric cars so that we can keep our car industry in this country alive, making sure that we have enough charging points, ensuring that we insulate homes, making sure that our bills go down forever, that we are never dependent on Putin or Saudi Arabia or anything else. Our bills will go down forever. We will be able to look after ourselves and we will have a different type of economy and we will grow now. Do you want to vote Green or do you want to vote Labour? Vote Labour. One thing I would say, just to sort of uh, chime with some of Laura's concerns, I've been a Labour voter my whole life. I very, very rarely, I would say actually never has the leadership totally represented all of my opinions, but I've given the vote to the Labour Party because it's not just the leadership, is it? It's the party, it's the membership, it's the movement, the coalition of people who have a shared vision, even if they have different ideas of how they want to do it, even if some are more left than others or Mm. whatever it might Mm. be. Mm. Is the Labour tent getting smaller? Is the big tent still there? No, we're the coalition on the left. We're the coalition on the left and the Tories are the coalition on the right. And there are some other minor parties. But I would say vote Labour. But is is there a danger, Emily, in... uh, I mean, for example, I'm just thinking about something that's happened uh, in the last week or so with the row over Jamie Driscoll, the decision of the Labour Party to block Jamie Driscoll from running to be the mayor of the new sort of northeast uh, area. And th- there's a sense that, or certainly he believes it's because of the perception that he was a, a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. Is there a danger that this kind of aggression towards the left of the party could put off some of Labour's core support? Is there a danger in the sort of whacking of the left that it could have the effect of depressing the vote? I mean, I don't think I agree with the with the question, really. I mean, I believe myself to be on the left of the party and I want us to be in power. I don't want to be a party of opposition. I don't think we can achieve anything in opposition. And I'm fed up with being in opposition. I want to be in government and I want to be able to change people's lives. And that does mean um, getting people who voted Conservative last time to vote Labour, as well as, of course, looking after our left flank as well. So it is a coalition and it is a difficult balancing act to make. But when it comes to candidates, we do have to be quite um, 
strict about who it is that is going to be a Labour candidate and who isn't. And I mean, I, I'm not in, I'm not on the NEC. I never have been, but I know that there are quite. Um, as I say, strict criteria that have been introduced recently and that has been controversial in some cases, but I'm not really, um, I'm not in a position to be able to comment on any particular case. But, you know, we need to be a professional outfit. To be honest, Emily, I did have a moment when I was like, I'm surprised you're still in the party because you are left wing. But I've always been in the Labour Party. I was born in the Labour Party. I don't believe in that there is a better government than a Labour government, no matter what. And that's what I have always worked for, is for a Labour government. And that's what I want. And, I, you know, I, jo- I joined the Labour Party because, you know, my I was brought up by a single parent on a council estate. I, you know, failed my 11 plus and I had free school dinners. We lived on benefits and the world was unfair and only the Labour Party could make that, be- that world better. That's why I joined the Labour Party. That's why I'm committed to it. And I do believe that we can make a difference. I wouldn't bother getting up in the morning if I didn't believe that. I, I definitely share that kind of sense of what the Labour Party can and has been uh, for the country. Um, But I do think that there are areas where some of us maybe feel a little queasy, Uh, certainly around like, for example, the issue of um, uh, migration and some of the kind of dog whistle racism that's being used uh, in the press, but also by frontline members of the Conservative Party. Um, I don't know what your personal relationship is with Suella Braverman. (laughs) But, like, <laughs> what the fuck is up with her? <laughs> I guess my question with Emily. Well, fuck she is was, up with Suella? <laughs> she was Attorney General for some time. And uh, uh, and I was Shadow Attorney General. And we had an interesting relationship. <laughs> 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 She's something else, isn't she? We've got a lovely clip of you and Suella <laughs> that we wanted to play. <laughs> Shadow Attorney General Emily Thornberry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And can I say what an honour it is to be at this dispatch box facing the next Prime Minister as she (laughs) waits her call from the palace. A true honour, although colleagues will have noticed in her list of leadership priorities last night, the Attorney General had absolutely nothing to say about tackling the epidemic of crime in our country or ending the culture of law-breaking in our government, both of which have flourished under her watch. So I see it's very cordial. (laughs) (laughs) I was just congratulating her. What's the problem? I mean, it'd be fair play, though. She is opportunistic. She's clearly gunning for it, isn't she? She's clearly going for it. She's clearly going for it. I think she's clearly thinking that if the Conservatives lose power next time, they won't have the ability to have a sort of self-reflection that they need to have and they will think that they, what they need to do is be more right-wing. And uh, good luck to them. And that's what they want to do. And if they want Suella as leader, good luck to them. Yeah, we've talked a lot about Suella Braverman on this. Um, but, you know, you're from the Labour Party, you're in front of us, so we have to ask you those attack ads with Rishi Sunak. That was... Oh, is this what we can expect? This kind of mudslinging, maybe a little bit of dog whistling, even from our side in the run-up to election? Why do you say dog whistling? If the uh, Conservatives are pushing this idea of Pakistani grooming gangs and then there's a Labour attack ad with a South Asian man on it saying that he's not doing enough on sexual violence against women, I'm not sure the average person knows the difference that Rishi Sunak is not Pakistani or not. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I think if you were to look at the optics of that, it's just it's both sides dog whistling about Asian men and that as a podcast we've hosted by two South Asians makes us very, very uncomfortable. Yeah, I have to say that when I saw the, the Sunak attack advert, a picture of Rishi Sunak next to, do you think adults convicted of sexually assaulting children should go to prison? Rishi Sunak doesn't. And especially when I sort of looked into it and found that, you know, for some of the period covered by the kind of explaining caption underneath it, Sunak wasn't even sort of in government. I have to say that my dog whistle racist spidey sense tingled. Mm, that, okay. I, I, that, I, I don't think there's a more scientific okay, way. Okay. I wish there was a more scientific way that I can put it than that. But there is just sometimes this feeling in, in your stomach when you look at something, you go, that, that, that doesn't feel right to me. And it made me, you know, I want the Labour Party to be the party of ideas and ideals. Yeah, all right. uh, so, fully costed, practically executed ideas and ideals, of <laughs> so, course. So let me just start. I mean, obviously, let's just like, put it out there that, that the vast majority of, of people who groom young women are white. 
And what Suella Braverman says about the majority of child groomers being Pakistani men of Pakistani origin is a lie. Right. So that's just like, let's put that straight. And then the other question is this, right? Is one of the things that happened when Rishi Sunak was elected was that we all celebrated the fact that it didn't make any difference that it, where it was that he came from, that he'd become leader, that he was from his South, South Asian heritage. But He's just your was normal a, millionaire like the rest well, of us. <laughs> I mean, all I'm saying is that is that... You know, we all were celebrating the fact that, you know, look at British politics. It doesn't make a difference. Now, so what we wanted to do with that advert was to say, you know, he's trying to make this into a presidential system. He's trying to say that it's all about him, that somehow or other that he has become the new Tory party, that he is the new Tory party. And yet we've had 14 years of failure on crime in Britain. Yeah, and the and, and the statistics are appalling. You know, do you know that it takes three years for a case, a rape case, to come to court? Mm. That less than two percent of of reported rape cases even come to court. You know, so that's 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 the legacy that we're getting, and we want to hold the Tories to account. And what we don't want is for him to float off and somehow say the Tories are great because I'm great. And I, we wanted to say now you're the Tory leader, and this is the failure that the Tories have had, and so. You have to hold. You have to be held accountable to that. That's what the reasoning behind it was. That I mean, that is the reasoning. And of course, what happened was that there was a hell of a hullabaloo about it for a good week or so, which kind of was good because we were able to talk about crime because we couldn't get it onto the agenda otherwise. You know, so yeah, we talked. We 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 blamed him for that. We blamed him for a whole load of things. I mean, it wasn't just that. I mean, there were other things. There was, I think, there was knife crime. We blamed him for. There was, you know, I mean, I can't. There, and there were things that weren't on the on the crime brief, but there were other things that we, we and we used the same thing. You know, Rishi Sunak doesn't believe in this because if Rishi Sunak did believe in, you know, doing something about this, he would do something about it. I mean, it's just like, you know, you're in charge of the country. Do something. Yeah, of here course. are the problems. Do something. If you don't do something, you must think that it's okay. Listen, we've got no problem of holding Hirishi Sunak to account, but there is just a reality that, you know, we don't want our ethnicity to be used as a political football. And when not. you have a brown man's face on a poster saying yeah, but, that this person doesn't care about yeah, but the grooming of I'm be, girls. I'm past that. I'm talking about him as prime minister. He's the prime minister and I should be able to hold him to account the same. You're not telling me that I should hold him to account a different way. I'm just saying I would expect the Labour Party to be a bit more sensitive to the on-the-ground experience of brown people. I also desperately want Rishi Sunak to be held to account mm. for his record as Chancellor, mm. the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, the inability to find huge sums of money that seem to have disappeared in the government's COVID procurement scheme. Exactly. Uh, and, and, and for his record, for the Conservative Party's record on crime, I do want the leadership held to account. But can you see how, from my perspective, I might have found the tone of that Labour uh, attack, at, you know, as a South Asian man, I might have found the execution of that accountability discomforting. I mean, I think my challenge to you that we shouldn't be treating Rishi Sunak any differently to anybody, uh, any other prime minister that we might have is, is a true one, you know, and is a hard one for you to get over. I mean, that's all I'm saying is that we treated him like we would treat anybody. If it had been a white woman, a white man, an Asian, Asian woman, an Asian man, you go for him because, or her, because they are responsible for the Tory record and yeah, we cannot allow them to but, get away with... Wasn't, we have, you know, he wasn't They're, they're not Doctor Who. Believe. They can't just like go, oh, look, I've gone into my time machine. I've come out. I'm a different person. We have a new Tory party. No, we're not accountable for anything else the previous ones have done. Yes, you are. 13 years. You are now the Prime Minister and you're going to be going to the next election and you're going to say, oh, don't blame me for what happened before. Look at me. I'm cuddly Rishi Sunak. Well, no, you're not. You are the leader of the Tory party and you have done all this to the country. I think we can talk about this more. But for now, you may be aware that we have a uh, special segment on this called Heroes and Villains. And I understand that you might have a hero for us. Oh, yes. Heather Hallett. <laughs> Heather Hallett's wonderful Heather Hallett, um, who is in charge of a an inquiry into what happened in Britain during COVID, and in particular, the government's response. And so the government set up an independent inquiry um, with pretty broad terms, but it was to be independent, and they put the glorious Heather Hallett in charge of it. Heather Hallett had done an inquiry into 7-7 and had done it in a way that nobody could criticise. And, uh, and now she wants to have the WhatsApp messages of the former prime minister. And whilst Boris Johnson seems to be, at least claims that he's happy to hand over everything, uh, the prime minister and the cabinet office are having a blue fit and don't want to hand it over and have decided to 
judicially review her. Now, what you do when you judicially review is you take a case to court and you say to a judge, this decision that's been made is uh, is 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 you know outside of the remits is is uh, quite extraordinary needs to be looked at carefully. We think that they, you know, there's something very wrong with the way that they've been making this decision. Um, please look at it again. And normally the government will be on the re- receiving side. You know, people will take ministers to court for making terrible decisions. But this time the government has taken. A judge to court for making a wrong decision. And it's Heather Hallett. Heather Hallett was the first woman to, I think the first woman, uh, to be in the Court of Appeal. Heather Hallett walks on water. I mean, she's, she, and, and, and there's going to be a judge somewhere who's going to have to decide whether Heather Hallett, I mean, I'm not just talking on behalf of the Labour Party here. I mean, she is, you know, with that through the, through the legal establishment, thought extremely highly of. But she has decided to take an independent, it doesn't matter what the government says. She says, I want to see the messages. They say they're not relevant. She says, well, let me have a look at them and I'll decide. And they're saying, no, we're going to take you to court. It's the most amazing thing. Anyway, she is standing her ground. And if I was a, if I was a family member who'd, left, who'd lost someone because of COVID and wanted to get some truth out of the COVID inquiry, I would think to myself, well, this Heather Hallett looks like she's got the business. I think uh, Heather Hallett clearly has guts of steel yes. because I don't think there's a force in the world that would make me want to look through Boris Johnson's WhatsApp. <laughs> I mean, given some of the stuff that man is, cap- is happy to say publicly... His WhatsApp. I mean, the the family filter is off. Let's just put it <laughs> <Yeah>. that way. <laughs> Emily Thornberry, we have to say goodbye, but thank you so much for your time today. Not at all. Thanks, Emily. So it's time now for the bit that I know many of our listeners look forward to. It's PSUK's Hero and Villain of the Week. We heard from Emily earlier, but Nish and I also have prepared something. So I'm going to kick off with uh, our hero, which is the Bristol Community Toilet Scheme. Um, This is a very classic Coco Khan story. As you know, Nish, I... I love to think about how the political impacts the personal and what could be more personal than our toileting habits. Now, the number of public toilets has drastically dropped over the last 15 years. It is causing difficulties for all manner of people, older people, pregnant women, menstruating women, people who just want to be out and about for longer than a few hours. Something I always think about on this uh, on this topic is how one of the suffragettes' very first issues that they took up was around public toilets. Because, of course, if women were kept on what they described as a urinary leash back then, they couldn't really travel much beyond their house. They couldn't be in public life. So for me, toilets are emblematic of a whole raft of things that we should be thinking about in society, inclusivity, participation, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, back to Bristol. They've had some of their public toilets closed down. And so the Bristol Community Toilet Scheme basically asks venues, churches, village halls, whoever wants to, to offer up their toilet to people. So The hero of the week is anyone who has done that. I think that's quite a big deal. I'm sure it has uh, practical ramifications, even just the extra cleaning of it. In fact, actually, there's a discussion going on at the minute with Bristol Council about whether they could reimburse some of those venues. And uh, if you want the PSUK line on that, yes, you should, Bristol Council. That only seems fair. Obviously, it's one of those things that you wish didn't happen. I wish there were ample public toilets. But in lieu of that, to see a community getting together and opening up their toilets for everyone, I think is absolutely wonderful. So big up the Bristol Bristol Community Toilet Scheme. And big up you, Coco Khan, for saying in lieu of that and not making some sort of toilet-based joke. You know what? Also, you're absolutely right. The politics of public toilets is such a specifically Coco Khan story. <laughs> such a, that such is my a... niche. That is the Venn diagram of my politics, is that. Um, Nish, what about your, your villain of the week? Well, it's lovely to hear from uh, uh, such a positive scheme and people doing good for their own communities. Now, for the absolute opposite end of that spectrum, uh, a villain of the week, a villain really of the decade, maybe even of the century. Uh, I'm going to return to everyone's uh, (laughs) everyone's favourite pro-Brexit campaigner whose blood type is real ale, uh, Nigel Farage. Um, He, in his continued ceaseless grift of a career, has launched a a new subscription service on Twitter uh, where you can pay £5 and you get access to Q&As on Twitter spaces, uh, exclusive behind-the-scenes content from the man himself, 
and you're able to win a pint with uh, Nigel as part of the uh, subscribers club. Let's actually hear uh, from uh, the shipberg himself, Nigel Farage, about why you should subscribe to his service. Well, thank goodness for Elon Musk. Twitter is now genuinely a public space for free and open debate. Never again can a Hunter Biden laptop not get reported and not get talked about. So because of that, I'm more enthusiastic about Twitter than I've ever been before. As, of course, is Tucker Carlson and many other people. And that's why I'm opening from today Twitter subscriptions. For $4.99 a month, you will get from me not only exclusive direct content and my own thoughts on things, things that perhaps should be said in private, not necessarily in public, but through Twitter spaces, I will do live broadcasts where you can come on, ask me questions directly, and there'll be prize draws every month. The winner comes to get a pint with Nigel. Oh, there'll also be free bottles of Farage gin to give out. So come on, join me on Twitter subscriptions. Give it a go for a couple of months. I promise you, it's gonna be the most enormous fun. I will be at times wholly irreverent, but I'll tell you what I really think. Cheers. Uh, unsurprisingly, Nige is a big fan of what Elon Musk has done with the platform. And uh, part of the reason he's clearly so enthusiastic about it is it's the latest avenue for one of his stupid fucking grifts. Uh, bear in mind, in recent years, he's been doing all sorts of hugely significant activities like encouraging people to buy silver and gold. Uh, he's uh, got his own line of gin, which is 40 quid a bottle. And uh, at one point, he was on the video sharing platform Cameo, uh, where he charged 75 quid a go to record a personal message. Obviously, people played absolute merry hell with that. And there were videos circulating on the internet of Nigel Farage saying uh, pro IRA messaging. Um, but in a weird way, you have to respect Nigel Farage because he has no agenda other than his own personal enrichment. <laughs> in another way, you have to have absolutely no respect for Nigel Farage because he's an absolute fucking asshole. And he his capacity to generate revenue for himself is his only point of interest. And it is absolutely unfathomable that we allowed this man to have any influence on our politics whatsoever. You know, what's sad about that is that I really agreed with everything you said, but I also thought I am signing up for Nigel Farage's Twitter. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just for my own entertainment. I can't. I didn't even find out about this from Twitter. I found out about this because uh, the good people at uh, Politico have been doing some. Uh, they've been doing God's work. They've been reporting on Nigel Farage's activities, uh, and uh, they were. Uh, it was through their website that I found out about this. Through their trawling of the murky sewers of Nigel Farage's latest grift, that I found. How out do we about know it. he's not on OnlyFans? Do we know for sure? A, a Farage OnlyFans. I think would be the least sexual thing of all time. I think if I saw a sexy photo of Nigel Farage, I would become unable to ever sustain an erection. Oh my god! For the but maybe this is life. like a maybe this is like a fin dom situation, <laughs> isn't it? We give him money. This is a fin dom that all makes sense. Wait, are you just leaving the phrase fin dom situation out there? Please <laughs> clarify for the non deviant community of our listeners. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Findom is like financial dominatrix or financial domination. Um, it's a kink. And I think that if you are giving Nigel Farage five pounds a month, I'm sorry to tell you, you are in a Findom situation. Um, we all have to learn about our kinks somehow. I'm glad that I can help you today. <laughs> <laughs> So if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email on psuk at reducelistening.co.uk or you can even send us a voice note on WhatsApp. Our number is 07514 and internationally that's plus four four seven five one four six four four. 572. If you're new to the show, remember to hit follow on your app and you'll get every new episode every week. Also, if you didn't write down those numbers, it's fine. It will be in the show notes. Uh, we'll be back next week when I will return from Canada. Uh, with a trade fresh, deal. Yeah, with a trade deal uh, stuffed full of poutine and wearing a, uh, a big uh, Mounties hat. Excited, I'm excited. Um, See you then. Pod Save the UK is a reduced listening production for Crooked Media. Thanks to senior producer Musty Aziz and digital producer Alex Bishop. Video editing was by David Kaplowitz and the music is by Vasilis Fotopoulos. Thanks to our engineer David Dargahi. The executive producers are Louise Cotton, Dan Jackson and Madeline Herringer. 
Watch us on the Pod Save the World YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Pod Save the UK. And hit subscribe for new shows every Thursday on Spotify, Amazon, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts.